Hub worlds in video games have always been a bit of a mystery to me. I love classic hubs like Mass Effect's The Normandy, Hyrule Field and Bloodborne's Yharnam as much as the next guy, but for the longest time I couldn't really figure out why. I mean, it's not like they have any particularly cool challenges in them or good story moments, and wouldn't it just be quicker and cheaper for developers to just make them into a menu, and that way players could get to the content they actually want to play much quicker, right? It wasn't until later on that I realised I was being a massive big dumb idiot. Hubs, despite their often unassuming nature, do some very important work behind the scenes, and even though we don't realise it, we rely on them to do a lot of the heavy lifting when it comes to helping us understand and interpret games correctly. To help demonstrate how they do exactly that, let's take a look at one of the best hubs ever, the Firelink Shrine from our good friend Dark Souls. I'm going to be circling back around to it between points because, uh, you know, that way it's like the hub of the video. huh? Huh? No? Well, I'm gonna do it anyway, up yours. The most obvious job of a hub world is probably to be a kind of training area. A low stakes playground for you to practice and muck around in before having that knowledge tested later on. Princess Peach's castle in Super Mario 64 is great at this, specifically in teaching players the ins and outs of 3D movement, which at the time was a terrifying new frontier. How terrifying exactly? Sonic's face in Sonic Adventure levels of terrifying. The castle exterior's most obvious path forwards forces you to learn how to orient yourself relative to the camera as you swing around here to the left, which helpfully also shows you the moat and this lake, which are perfect spots for practicing swimming. Inside the castle is much the same story. These coins up here teach you about ledges and jumping from sloped surfaces, and the staircase that shows you these two locked doors also curves round to show you the entrance to the first level, Bob on Battlefield, and points you where you need to be going. Other Mario hubs pull this off too by placing the entrances to harder worlds behind trickier platforming challenges. Delfino Plaza's harder to reach areas like Pianta Village are hidden behind obstacles that are relatively easy to conquer like this big rocket jump, but serve to introduce platforming concepts you'll need later, such as in the approach to the final boss fight. Of course, the Firelink Shrine does this too, and in a uniquely Dark Souls way. Once the tutorial has taught you the controls, Firelink picks up the much more difficult slack of teaching you how the game actually works, starting by introducing you to the interconnected world of Lordran. The entire shrine is built on these curving spiral patterns, where you'll constantly be looping back to old areas. Even after leaving and getting some way into the game, Dark Souls loves bringing you unexpectedly back home. After defeating the Gargoyles or the Capra Demon, the obvious path forwards actually brings you right back to Firelink, which just so happens to be a very convenient starting location for an adventure into Blighttown or the Depths, which is where you need to go next in order to fight Quellag. These constant trips back to the hub firmly establishes not just Firelink's status as a central area, but also the place you should always return to after beating a major boss. There's also the Skeleton Graveyard that serves as the eventual entrance to the Catacombs. Now, common beginner advice for Dark Souls is that people shouldn't fight the skeletons, and well that's basically true, but that undercuts one of the most important lessons Firelink has to teach you, and that is to fight smart instead of hard. These skelly boys will wreck a starter character, but some careful exploration will net you a weapon that's much more effective against them, the Morning Star. In exploring the graveyard, new players will also learn that optional harder challenges can net cool rewards like this badass Zweihander, but also that there's usually more than one route forwards, namely the path to the undead berg that helpfully gets shown whenever you respawn after getting chopped into bits by skeletons. In games where the player has a lot of freedom like in Dark Souls, hubs are a blessing for designers. There aren't very many other places you know a player will repeatedly return to, making hubs the ideal spot to give them a helping hand when and where they need it most. Not only are hub worlds a very clever way of introducing players to the mechanical concepts they need to know, hubs can also be used to communicate the themes and story of a game in a passive, non-verbal way. In World of Warcraft, Wrath of the Lich King, Dalaran was the main hub city of the new continent, Northrend. It's this flying wizard town that both the Alliance and Horde had to squeeze into together. Dalaran feels small and cramped. In its heyday, heroes of both factions filled the streets and had to reluctantly share the same shops, trainers and quest givers. There was this sense that you and your adventuring buddies were having to make do, turning a neutral, mostly civilian enclave into the beachhead in the fight against Arthas, and that the Alliance and Horde were so screwed that they were having to work together on this one. Dalaran's presence was a relatively small part of Northrend, but it added so much to the flavour and feel of the expansion that it became this beloved part of the game. So much so that Blizzard brought it back a few years later down the line in Legion, where the Alliance and Horde had to team up again under similar circumstances. If a game's regular levels, zones or quests are like the verses of a song, then a hub will be the chorus. It's the repeated central theme of the world or story, and a way of tying everything together on a conceptual level. 
Because they're a constant feature of the game that gets revisited over and over again, hubs can cement themes in the mind of a player through sheer repetition. In Deep Rock Galactic, a co-op space mining game, the hub world is this great low budget corporate housing where you could hang out with your fellow dwarves between missions. Oh, by the way, the player characters are dwarves, I don't know why. When you combine the presence of a bar, your boss barking in your ear to stop kicking barrels around, and the blatant disregard the game has for your lives, you're left with a hub that gives this awesome slacker movie vibe, with you and your friends trying to get by under the thumb of the man and inject some fun into otherwise lethal work conditions. If Deep Rock had opted for a much more generic theme, the hub world would be little more than a glorified and particularly clunky menu, but by embracing an ironic late stage capitalist aesthetic where your bosses will even charge you for party hats and care more about the expensive equipment than your lives, the game engenders this weird sense of camaraderie in spite of the odds. For example, a tradition my team developed was a pre-mission drink, followed by throwing our mugs into the drill in order to piss off our supervisor. It cost money and basically didn't help us at all, but thanks to some stellar hub design, it was a highlight of my time with the game and set the stage for many a drunken death. The Violink Shrine, of course, also executes on this concept fantastically. It's one of the few safe-ish areas in the game, and rather than being this grand bastion against the darkness, Firelink feels like the last tiny speck of light and hope fighting against the darkness on all sides. After beating a major boss, you inevitably have to return to the shrine, and it's in this return that you're given a chance to self-reflect and see how far you've come. And that's what Dark Souls is about, really, triumphing over seemingly insurmountable odds. Dark Souls loves looping you back to old areas, and specifically through Firelink because it's a way of physically demonstrating your increased mastery. Remember when those dumb skeletons kicked your ass at the beginning of the game? Well now you get to come back and utterly destroy them on your way to the Tomb of Giants, as a way of demonstrating your newfound power. Isn't that neato? In addition to being a way to introduce people to playing a game, hubs can also be a really clever way of keeping people playing and stopping them getting bored. To illustrate this point, I'd like to direct you to Exhibit A, Doom 2016, and Exhibit B, Wolfenstein The New Order. At first glance, they might appear to be very similar games. They're both throwbacky, high-octane shooters, they're about the same length, they're published by the same company, and they've both got similar rave reviews. So why is it then, that of all the people who've played these two games, almost twice as many have actually finished Wolfenstein? The answer, surprisingly, can be found in the presence of a hub world. Each mission in Wolfenstein Beyond the First Few ends with a trip back to the Kreisau Circle, we are made to do some odd jobs for the characters, chat to people a bit, or go exploring in the sewers for some low stakes, slower paced gameplay. The Kreishaus Circle is this safe area, a place where you don't have to constantly scan the environment for loot, ammo and angry Germans, giving you an opportunity for a well deserved break. One of the problems all media faces is the tendency for human brains to attenuate, which is a fancy word meaning get used to. If you subject a brain to the same stimulus over and over again, you're going to need to continually ramp up the intensity to stop people getting bored. This is Doom's major stumbling block. There are no breaks. It's non-stop action all the time. And while that's a lot of fun, there's only so much Doom can do to keep you engaged, and eventually it'll start to run out of steam. For most people, this is around the first trip to hell. It's not that the game isn't fun anymore, it just stops feeling new and exciting around the halfway mark. Wolfenstein, however, smartly sidesteps this problem by using hubs as a seamless connection between levels, keeping you engaged but thinking about the game in a different way. By spending some time doing odd jobs for Set, or uh, having a very nice chat with Anya, you give the parts of your brain responsible for FPS gameplay a bit of a well-deserved break. Firelink also fills this role really well. Between its eventual collection of shopkeeper NPCs, the Lord Vessel and its relatively central location, the shrine quickly becomes this nexus you'll spend a little bit of time in after each big boss, providing a natural start and end point to play sessions as well as a way of thematically separating the various areas of Lordran. While in Firelink, you're thinking about how you're going to level up, what supplies you'll need, and which areas you've yet to visit, and not about the deadly terrifying skeletons. By giving you the time and space you need to chill out and calm down in a hub world, the mystery and terror of Dark Souls' baddies never becomes routine, and you always want to keep playing. Hubs can train players, setting up their expectations for what lies ahead, they're great at summing up the themes of a game, plus they provide crucial downtime and a change of pace to keep engagement high. But these things, more or less, can basically be done by other game mechanics. So why are hubs so important? What's the one thing only they can do? Well, that only becomes apparent when we change them. In most games, an individual level is pretty fire and forget. You go there, beat the challenge, and then move on. 
but hub worlds are a constant fixture, and by changing how a player perceives them, developers can change the entire feel of a game. Late in Deus Ex Mankind Divided story, a huge riot breaks out for uh, very spoilery reasons, and suddenly the city goes from a safe, if unwelcoming and grimy central location to one of the most dangerous maps in the game, crawling with cops and security robots that can down you in a matter of seconds. Turning even basic level traversal into a stealth gauntlet and really hammering home the new hostile nature of the game. Another great example is blowing up the Normandy at the start of Mass Effect 2, which comes totally out of left field. Even if you do get it back a few hours later, the intro is a symbolic act, destroying and rebuilding the old hub to reflect the game's shift into a new, darker tone and its massive combat overhaul. A changing hub can also reflect a change in how the player feels about a game's story, recontextualizing old information and opinions. Nier Automata starts its Androids vs Alien Robot story in a beautiful overgrown city, but as the story becomes darker, more complex and morally grey, the city itself becomes more and more ruined, filled with craters and the corpses of giant battle bots, as well as other things that I, uh, I won't spoil. A hub world is a way to connect different levels and areas, sure, but it's also a way to connect the player to the game itself. A hub is our window into the game, a lens that focuses and changes how we perceive it. Your home base in a survival game like Oxygen Not Included is your central frame of reference for the entire world that you've created, going from a tiny shelter in a hostile world to a massive fortress, growing in tandem with your increased mastery of the world and your changing relationship with the game. It was upon coming to this conclusion that I realised that hub worlds are just one manifestation of a key idea in video games, that of a conceptual foundation, a jumping off point that allows you to understand and engage with the more abstract and complex ideas a game presents. A game's hub or foundation needn't be a physical space, they could just be an idea that serves as your connection to the game. Final Fantasy XV's ragtag band of boys are a hub onto themselves, with the entire game revolving around the gang's relationships and character development. XCOM's underground base and spaceship hubs help your decisions feel more important as well as allow you to get to know the soldiers you'll be sending in to die, between the big imposing world map, the little snippets of radio chatter and the snapshots of your soldier's life outside the battlefield, XCOM's hubs give you the sense of brutal agency that a linear series of missions never could. Ok, ok, I'm kind of stretching the definition of hubs here, you caught me. But let's go back to that original question, what are hubs actually for? I think now we can confidently say that they're a way of bringing together and connecting parts of a game, the player included, that would otherwise struggle to organically fit together in a way that makes sense. If you want a chemistry simile, and let's be honest, who doesn't, they're kind of like an emulsifier. Hubs ease the transition between different gameplay and narrative ideas, and form a single, central place that showcases everything the game is about. And that leads us right onto Dark Souls and the Firelink Shrine. Dark Souls is a game that is outwardly hostile to the player, and uncompromisingly difficult, but beneath that is a game that's fundamentally about hope, about the drive to surpass what you thought were your limits. The Firelink Shrine is an area that's constantly growing and expanding with new characters and routes right up until the end, each one presenting you with a new challenge to overcome, from the graveyard skeletons right up to Gwyn Lord of Cinder. The Firelink Shrine is in equal parts a microcosm of Dark Souls as a whole, and also its beginning and end. It's your introduction to the world of Lordran, and also the way out. It's the perfect hub. A place to learn, a place to understand, a place to reset, but most importantly, a place to connect. Hello and thank you for watching. This video was brought to you in part by support from my super cool patrons, some of the names of which you should be able to see on your screen right about now. If you'd like to support the channel, please consider chipping in a few bucks, or if you don't want to spend any dosh, do the whole like, comment, subscribe thing and post a video somewhere you think people will enjoy it. As part of the top tier Patreon supporter level, I give some brilliant people a very special shout out and they are Alex Deloch, Asaran, Auno94, Baxter Heel, Brian Natariani, Calvin Han, Daniel Metges, Dirk Jan Karenbeld, Feetzalot, Ivar Olofsson, Jesse Ryan, Jonathan Kirkinson, Joshua Binswanger, Leet2, Lucas Slack, Lucas Mora, Lunar Eagle 1996, Mace Window 54, Patrick Romberg, Ray's Dad, Samuel Vanderplatz, Strateger in Ultima, and Chow.
And for all you YouTube commenters who say I've been pronouncing the names wrong, you're probably right. So if I have been pronouncing your name wrong, please send me a message and I will do the best I can to pronounce it properly in future. Sorry. Uh, right, thank you very much for watching and I will see you around. Bye!